Dartfish friends and a very warm welcome to a very special place. Joining me today, Steve Rimmer, the founder of Dartfish. Steve, I have to say, first of all, thank you very much for inviting us to this incredible place here today. Well, Colin, thanks for coming. It's a long way. Uh, Seattle is a long way in people's minds from uh, Europe and, uh, and the world of rally. So um, I'm glad you made the journey and we're delighted to have you here. Well, we we you got some much. welcoming weather for you, typical Seattle weather. Um, it's a little chilly around here as well. It so uh, the you snow, should be at home. There's snow in the forecast as well. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure that you, you and David brought that with you. Yeah. <laughs> well, as Steve just said, we are just outside Seattle. We're not going to give away exactly where we are uh, for a very good reason. Steve, you know, I'm sure our viewers have already realised that it is a special place here. Tell us what goes on in this building, first of all. There, there are some incredible pieces of machinery here. It's a special place for me. Um, I, I'm delighted it seems to be a special place for a number of people who we interact with. Um, and as people actually learn more here in the US about rally. Yeah. I hope it will continue to be and grow to be a special place. But it's, um, it's basically a warehouse, right? <laughs> but it's not the building that makes it special. Yeah. It's what's in it yeah. and the people associated with it. Um, this place exists for me to be a kid in a candy store. It exists to really take me back to my youth. Um, it proves a lot of things. Um, it proves that I've been pretty fortunate, but it also proves that I, I can't drive. <laughs> I get in some of these pieces of history and, and realize, wow, you know, what they were, what they are, and what, uh, you know, I, I just enjoy them. But um, I, what we're trying to build this place to be is somewhere um, that we can display and use uh, the things that I admired lusted yeah. after you know grew up around yeah some of the greatest pieces of automotive engineering are on display in here and it's fantastic and they're not as you say just on display but it's interesting as you mentioned there that you know you grew up admiring these cars let's go back a little <laughs> bit steve let's let's go back and talk because you know i'm fascinated to know how, how a boy from preston ends up in seattle uh, with this sort of toy collection it's an incredible story, but let's go back. Let's go back to Preston. Tell us a little bit about uh, your early days, your schooling and, and, uh, and your, your early childhood. So I, I grew up in Preston, uh, as you said. I grew up in a family that didn't have a car until, they were, until I was, I think, 10 years old, maybe nine years old, when my, my father bought a, a Ford Anglia. I remember him driving it home. Uh, he brought it in Blackpool, drove it home. I still remember the registration plate, VFR 615 wow. was the, um, uh, the car. So not exactly a motoring family. Right. Um, father is an aircraft design engineer, worked in British Aerospace, so aeroplanes were uh, part of my, my childhood. Mm. Cars became part of my childhood really through friends. Uh, going through secondary school there, um, had a group of friends who, who were really passionate about cars. And just chance couple of them very committed to rallying right. and so that really was the introduction um, it was it, it was fortuitous um, but um, as my father upgraded his cars um, I eventually persuaded him to get involved in uh, Mark 1 Escorts and wow. uh, Persuading him the Escort Mark 1 1300 GT was absolutely the car he needed. I couldn't try quite get to an RS 1600 or an RS 2000, but managed to get there. Um, uh, that car had some interesting experiences a bit with me behind the wheel. Um, I ended up having to buy the car really off, to, off, off my dad because of, I think the engine had had quite a bit of <laughs> useful life taken out of it. So, but I grew up in Preston until um, I was 18 and. And, and worked at British Aerospace. Um, yeah, just, uh, just, just, just tell us a little bit more. I mean, I'm intrigued by this, this Escort and, yeah. the, uh, and you and, and, and what you did to your poor dad's car. But, you know, obviously you and your group of friends did discover rallying. Um, your first rally, do you remember going along to your first rally, the first rally car that you saw on an event? Because, you know, Preston is kind of right in the heartland, isn't it, of, of British rallying up there in the northwest of it, England? It is. And, um, 
the first rally I went to was based out of Blackpool. I'm going to get the, I want to say it was the R.L. Brown rally, um, the motoring news round of the uh, possibly, Road yeah. Rally Championship. Yeah. Um, and a lot of it took place, it was based in Blackpool, uh, but, but took place in the Trough of Boland, uh, primarily. The, so from Blackpool uh, over towards Lancaster, right. and then the Trough of Boland is like the moors over the top yeah. of, of Lancaster, the back of Lancaster, over towards Clitheroe and, and that. Right. So a night rally, um, you know, starting off about 11 o'clock at night, using the public roads. Yeah. Um, and I spent a lot of time trying to navigate my way around to an appropriate corner on the, on the midst of the moors and it was misty and it was cold and it was damp. Um, but that was really my first experience and it, it was road rallying. Right. Um, road rallying was kind of the cheapest form that we could think about um, participating in if you, you know, oh, when, when I grow up, I want to be able to participate in that. Yeah. The stage rallies were a step above that but but I um, I used to go with friends from school um, and I say spend a Saturday night early hours of Sunday morning and, and look forward to an egg and bacon breakfast at the end of the morning um, when the rally's finished and it, it, it's a great the road rally community is a great community isn't it you know there's 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 a little bit of edginess about it and that sometimes they're doing things they shouldn't be doing perhaps um with speed limits and uh, absolutely but it's a wonderful community and, and as you say it's that it's that you know through the night challenge and then the coffee and the bacon butties the next oh. morning and the stories recounting the stories yeah um you know and I, there there were some key figures there some key key people there who i think you're really sticking my memory i mean bill Gwynn. Motoring News Rally champion, yeah. you know, um, uh, Mick Bryant. Yeah. Um, people who, in my eyes in those days, were, you know, the, the, the top echelon of, of people you would aspire to be. Um, but they were also people who you would follow through the Motoring News when it dropped through the door every, every yeah. Thursday morning. You'd be waiting for that. Uh, motoring news and, and the first thing would be you know to look at the results on motoring news rally championship um, the second one would be the advertisement page you know I, <laughs> I, I don't know if you're, you you see on social media but um, some people post those historic adverts back from from the era where you know a, a mark II rs 1800 was being sold for three thousand five hundred pounds you know and you right. thought that was um, you know wow, I wish I could afford that, or an RS200 of the day. Yeah. But it, that all took you back, I think, to those road rallies, you know, mm -hmm. because that was, it was the closest approximation you could see to what you could go into the local Ford dealer and buy. And you saw it out on a Saturday night being rallied. So um, that was my first experience of it. Right. Um, I, I, I tried it a couple of times, not As very driver, successful. Well, as a driver, um, not very successfully. I think you might find my name on an entry list somewhere, but I'm not sure you'll find it on the finish list or certainly not <laughs> on, on anywhere up the results. Yeah. My, my one attempt at co-driving in a road rally was actually, and I'm sure we'll get to it, was in Scotland. Right. And um, a friend um, up there said, he said on a Friday morning, he said, I'm, this is in air in Scotland. Mm. He said, I'm short of a co-driver for tomorrow night, fancy you got it. And I kind of know what goes into co-driving and not only the capabilities and the skills, but the ability to stare down at uh, a piece of paper and read things at speed round corners. Well, okay, he's a good friend, I, I gave it a go. And um, I did some prep, not very well it turned out. And then third corner of the rally, 90 degree left. I didn't call it <laughs> because you, you, you tried to set it out. You, you got a set of coordinates and you got an ordnance survey map. And so you, 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 you yeah, well, it's not notes we're talking about no. here. It was literally, it was maps you were reading. Ma off. Magnifying glass. With well, the potty the they call it. Yeah, they? yeah, exactly. And, yeah. and, 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 uh, <laughs> and the car park's full and all the drivers are out having coffee and talking to one another. And all the co-drivers are in the, 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 the passenger seat going, what the heck yeah, have yeah. I just agreed to? I've got this yeah. map. So put it, Bluntly, I missed the 90 degree left. What could possibly go wrong? A farmyard was ahead of us, a pig farm. We went straight on <laughs> and the floor was covered with pig <laughs> excrement, let's say. We did 
a triple donut around that. Got a lot of a, a, a lot of applause yeah. and went on. And I, that was kind of the last I remember of that rally. Because oh, wow. I'm sure my driver at that time, um, I'm sure he just he just navigated himself for the rest of it. And I picked up some waypoints, which were, I think we're coming to the end of a stage now. We just slow down. That was about it. That's, that's the fun of those type of rallies, wasn't it? You could do that. You could, you could get the phone call in the morning and you could just about, just about get into the co-driver's seat. Yeah. And, you know, and, and you could take part in, in a rally effectively. It's, I think road rallying has its place very much in the, in the rallying hierarchy, doesn't it? And it introduces so many people to the sport. It, it, even more so in the past, I think. Mm. And today, I think a lot more people jump straight into stage. But yeah. but you, you know, it's it certainly historically was a great stepping stone. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and but interesting is some people never, you know, gravitated out of it. Yeah. You know, you think of, you know, you, you think of Mick Bryant and you think of Rob Rally. Yeah. I think. I, well, yeah. I do anyhow. I'm not sure he did that much on the stage. Is Bill Gwynn. Yeah. master of the road rally um you know very capable in stage rally but i'm not sure the first memory of him that comes to my mind would be a uh, stage rally so some people stayed in that lane yeah. and were very successful at it um i kind of moved on a little bit um into stage rallying for uh, you know if anybody's listening to this hope they are some of your listeners might remember the names tony and nigel worswick mm -hmm. and um tony currently rallies a, a, a yellow three a Ferrari through eight GTV. You remember he, he does a lot of um, uh, tarmac stuff, but Tony and Nigel were uh, an R. Um, their family had an engineering firm in Blackburn. Right. And, and Nigel um, had, he, he was, I, I did a, my degree course I did at uh, Pre what was then Preston Polytechnic, now University of Central Lancashire. And I had a friend out and out rally nut who uh, was a quantity surveyor, training to be a quantity surveyor, and um, Nigel Worswick um, was in his course. So uh, Nigel used to come to college in a Group 4 Mark II RS 1800. Wow. Because Tony and Nigel at their workshop, you know, they were building the rally cars. Yeah. And, um, and, and so that kind of helped me gravitate towards the stage rallying and going and, and, and so and viewing. This is when you're, you're still a young man, you're still finding your way in life. Um, and, you know, at that point, I suppose, uh, you're, you're, you're developing a, another career. You know, you've got rallying on one hand, but you're moving into uh, what has allowed you, I suppose, to, to amass this incredible collection. You were moving in to your aviation career. Yeah. How did the two, how did the two uh, develop at that point, the, the motorsport and the, the aviation? I'd love to say there was a plan, <laughs> but with so much of life, it's being in the right place, right time, um, having opportunities and grabbing them. Um, so after I graduated from college, I was working at British Aerospace, um, got offered a position um, to go up to Scotland and um, I ended up working there for six years. But, but in that transition up to Scotland, again, by chance um, within the British Aerospace uh, group there I, I bumped into a you know still one of my best friends um, uh, who lived and worked lived in Scotland worked at British Aerospace Callum McLeod and um, he and I he was an avid rally fan is an avid rally fan and uh, falling up in Scotland not knowing anybody else basically or not knowing many people to to fit into to the rallying community up in Scotland. Callum and I, you know, we would talk all the time and, um, and the coffee machine at British Aerospace or Scottish Aviation as it was then on the second floor there. Mm. We used to sort of more or less coordinate times to bump into one another there and spend <laughs> 15 minutes catching up on what was going on. So rallying um, was maintained, again, through friendships. Mm. Um, got to know a lot of people, but I, the career to the extent you can call it a career, was starting to become a little bit more important. Mm. So um, I spent a lot of time working in Scotland, not enough time to say I participated in much except that infamous mm. road rally. I spent more time working um, uh, on the aviation side. And again, I was fortunate to be at uh, British Aerospace in Scotland at a time when they were launching a new product. I was able to 
uh, progress a little bit in my own career through that. I was able to start traveling a lot, um, based up in Presswick in Scotland, but I, I ended up looking after Australasia uh, okay. for, for the sales, uh, marketing and, and financing of a product they had in those days, the Jetstream 31. Didn't leave me as much time for motorsport. So it's much more of a following motorsport from more of a distance. You know, I, I'd gone from uh, being way more time than I could go and spend time in Grisdale and, uh, you know, the forests of the yeah. Lake District or up in Kielder. You know, that, that age span from sort of 18 to 21 involved a lot of that because that was college university time and I, I could fit a lot in. Yeah. When it got to 22, 23, it was more, much more following it from a distance. But Scotland is Scotland and Scotland is rallying. And so um, I was able during my time in Scotland, still when I was back at, uh, back at the office, so to speak, I was able to spend time watching people like Jimmy McRae. Um, Alison McRae, Colin oh. McRae, you know. Um, so you were out in the forest. What, yeah, when these I guys mean, were locals. Doing the Scottish yeah. Championship. And yeah, absolutely. You know, oh. wherever I could, I would do it. You know, right. and again, Callum, uh, my friend, we we try and go together, or um, other friends that I got there. What was your favourite rally in Scotland? Which was the one that you would, uh, you know, you would make an absolute, you know, that's that's in the calendar. I'm going to that one. That's a tough one to answer because I think a lot of the things I remember is the RAC coming through there in different stages and then going down towards Dumfries and, yeah, and yeah. seeing that area. I'm not, I don't know the answer to that one, yeah. Colin. Well, Ayrshire had some really good local rallies. Yeah, so that's maybe a, an easier way to put it because as you say, the RAC now, you, yeah. you could almost, there are a dozen rallies within right. that. Right. So the, the, the best stages, the best stages in Scotland to go and, and uh, inspect it back in the day when you were out there. Because these were Group B cars sometimes that they yep. were, certainly on uh, the Scottish Rally and some of those rallies, they were, they were proper cars with proper drivers. Yeah, and, and, and Group B era, um, I'd, I'd sort of moved on a little bit. I was moving out of Scotland, so I was, I was, I was down in London, at the, really the, the core of the Group right, B era. Right. But you're right, I mean, the start was, you know, in the 84, 85 sort of time frame. I, there was some of my time up in Scotland. Um, I loved a lot of the, the rallies throughout Ayr Ayr Ayrshire, yeah, the local rallies. Like that. But, but then I said, down in Dumfries, you know, my memory is not going to allow me to recall stage names. No, I, listen, I, I, I don't remember stage it. names from last uh, week, never mind. But, from but, but, <laughs> um, but I, I spent a lot of time um, down in, in the Dumfriesshire area, yeah. and there are just some awesome places yeah. to actually spectate down there. Absolutely. And also the people. You know, being on some of those stages with the Scottish rally crowd, um, it was entertainment. It was, you know, it, it was Around, just. I, I remember that kind of done for sure. That even even to this day, you get huge crowds, and they're, yeah. they're such a knowledgeable community, rally community down there. I think one of the things I miss is that community. Mm. Um, you know, if you think we're here in the U.S., and you know what we what we're trying to do you know, somewhat with Derpfist Media, as you know very well, is, mm. is, is, is educate people, is bring them into something that we're all passionate about. Um, and here in the US, I, I miss some of that community. But you're uh, in the right part of the US for it. I, yeah. I have to say one of the best events I've ever been to, and it's in my top three, I would say, of events around the world, was the Oregon Trail Rally, an event that Derpfist have been quite heavily involved in right. in the past. And you know, it wasn't necessarily the stages, because the stages were great. It wasn't necessarily the cars, although they were spectacular and that most of them were garage built by the, the drivers. But it was the people. The people at the Oregon Trail Rally were amongst the best, friendliest, most welcoming, most uh, knowledgeable rally people. And, it, you know, and it, and it makes such a difference when you feel welcomed and welcomed into their community. And, you know, that, that's, that's part of, I suppose, your community around here. I, I, I think you're right to correct me uh, a little bit. Or, or I correct you? No, Sorry no. about that. <laughs> no, no, no. To, to focus me on the fact that um, what we have here is special. Yes, very I'm, special. I, I certainly didn't try, I wasn't trying to say that it's not special. I think the, the U.S. generally is missing that community. Yeah. 
Um, there are pockets, aren't there? There are. I mean, you, you think of mm. Pacific Northwest, you think of um, you know, the East Coast, uh, the upper Northeast Coast there. We maybe lack a little bit of the history right. that like Scotland or Wales has. Yeah. Um, but having said that, I think one of the most special things you, you talk to people around here, one of the most special things around here is you think back to the WRC round of the Olympus Rally. You think of how key a component that was yeah. in terms of um, the development of some of the Group B cars. I mean, you know, you think of Mikola coming here, yeah. admittedly with the earlier version of, uh, uh, of the, the Quattro, but yeah. it was where it was debuted. So, yeah, you know, so it, 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 images, it is important. The yeah. images from the Olympus Rally are still there and yeah. still right up there amongst the most yeah. iconic of yeah. rallying images. Let's go back a little bit then because we've kind of jumped forward did, a wee sorry, bit. Yeah. No, 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 it's, it's fascinating. Um, you've, 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 had, you've had this introduction to rallying while you were at college and at school. You've then moved into your, your aviation career, uh, which, which then obviously took off, uh, you know, and, and you, I'm sure you, know, you began to find a degree of success in aviation. At what point did you think, actually, aviation might allow me to indulge my passion in rallying a little bit further and perhaps in a different kind of way with, with the collecting of cars? I'd, I'd always love cars. Um, if you ask me um, growing up, you know, what was, what was my most iconic road car? You know, I, I had a friend, the same friend who was on that uh, quantity surveying course with uh, Nigel Worswick, a guy named Steve Aikman. His first job was as a, um, uh, was, was an apprentice out there in the field. And, we are in Preston, he got a job in Morecambe, and his boss had a 911 930 Turbo. And he would pick him up at the roundabout of the, what is now the M55 junction on the M6, and drive him up to Morecambe for the day and come back. I used to stand at that roundabout and wait for him to come and get <laughs> dropped off, because that 911 was just so iconic in my mind. Yeah. So when I thought of cars and car collecting, there was two distinct lines in my mind. It was road cars and it was, it was rally cars. Um, I'd always from those days said, I want a 911. Mm -hmm. I'd always from the days in the forest say, oh, would I love to have a Mark II Escort like, you know, yeah. Anna Mikula and Bjorn Valdegaard are driving. Absolutely. Would I want uh, an Audi Quattro? Would I want a T16? I'd love, them, you know. So it, it was always there is my point. Right. Uh, so there's always that parallel, you're, you're driving the career forward. Obviously, personally, there was this ambition there, but right. there was this, so, you needed to fulfill something so, as well. So then money was the missing piece, right? Yeah. Th there were a couple of other things which were a little demanding on time and focus, you know, family, um, you know, having a couple of kids yeah. um, and making sure that they got the right time and yeah. focus. So a lot of things had to come into place. You, you, we, we often think, oh, if I had the money, I'd go and do that. But the, life has a, lo a lot of things that you've got to take care of, family, work, and then cars, of course. Um, cars, back in 2006, everything comes back. I'm gonna blame Callum McLeod for everything. You know, that fateful meeting in Scotland back in 1981, it's got a They're lot to trouble. answer Scottish for. Scottish people are just trouble. They are. Trouble. They, they are. really are. Um, and they spend everybody else's money. So that's why I got, ended up spending my money. So uh, <laughs> and Callum sat there and said, oh, this is great. You know, but but um, we, uh, Callum had carried on, as I say, because, partly because he was in Scotland, partly still in Scotland, UK. He would carried on participating in rallying actively and right. competing. And, and he had uh, bought a... A GC8, Subaru GC8, Group N. Um, it was a four door. I actually still have it. It still lives at Dirtfish. Um, oh. He bought that car um, and had upgraded it and decided to go for a, a two door. And he called me one day. Remember, he now is over in Europe. I'm here in Seattle. Steve, you really need to get back rallying. I've wow. got the ideal deal for you. I'm upgrading my car. I'll I'll sell you my blue GC8. It's going to be a bargain. You'll love it. And I'm going, what makes sense about this? <laughs> <laughs> I'm in Seattle. The car is actually with Ian Gwynn, oh, uh, BGM okay. Sport. 
Um, and that was how I met Ian. Right. Um, and he's been responsible for a hell of a lot of expenditure over the years. A lot to answer for. Uh, he has. <laughs> um, but, but Callum said, you should buy my car. It's ideal for you. And whenever you come over here, I'll, you know, you can go and drive it. So ideal for you in what regard? Ideal for you in that you can take it out and, and take it for a little drive? Ex or exactly. Just... Ex right. Well, he, his concept was leave it with Ian. He'll take care of it. Um, at the time, uh, Ian had, had the, his, his uh, business was at the airfield, at the Western yeah, Airfield. Yeah, yeah. He said, you know, you've got the rally track there. You can go and use it. Right. And, you know, he's dangling this carrot and saying, okay, okay. Quite you know. persuasive. So yeah. that kind of turned on the spigot that has been I'd like to say restricted but it's not that much these so days was, was that the very first car then in terms of that, that was the very first pure rally car right that I bought and you've clearly kept that car as you say it's so I've kept it it's a favorite car of mine to drive still up at Dirtfish I'll drive it from time to time not often enough and I think if you ask James uh, and maybe even Josie our kids driving that GC8 is you know, it's something special. It's part so, of the family. Yeah, so that yeah. was the first sort of real usable rally car that I owned. And I think it was 2006, maybe, 2005, 2006. So Ian Gwynn, I went over and saw him a couple of times, took the family, ended up buying a, a, a off Callum's son, uh, if I recall correctly, a Peugeot 205 GTI, nice. just a regular, yeah. you know, a rally car. As I recall, the first time the kids turned up, it was covered in polka dots because Ian had decided to make it the kids' car. It was a white one and there's polka dots all over it. Um, and, and they used to drive that car at Ian's school. But that was, so that was probably the second yeah. rally car. Yeah. But the real first collector car was Ian called me and said, you know, there's some opportunities that, you know, don't think about 911s and Ferraris. Mm. Rally cars are the collector's cars of the future. And so he said, th there's this real steal of a deal. It's a Skoda. This is awesome. It was a Skoda yeah. Octav Octavia, you know, and WRC car. Ah, yes. And I said, wow, a WRC car. I never, ever dreamed. And even in those days, you know, the WRC cars were unachievable in terms of pricing yeah. but the Skoda looked like a great deal so we bought that and um, that was the first car I think probably 06 07 right. um, so the Skoda was the first really important rally car I had uh, WRC car um, and a car that proved to be um, so special uh, for me, couldn't really afford um, a WRC car, um, but the Skoda was everything and more than I thought it would be. It, it was the car which actually was the car that got us an entry into Goodwood. Wow. It was a car that allowed me to drive around Goodwood, um, which is such a special experience. And Ian Gwynn proved to be right. It was a great investment. and. And you know, part of motoring history now, when you think of where Skoda is today compared to where it was in the day, you know, look at the Skoda R5s and, and the success and everything else that's out there. It, it progressed from Steve's playground to be able to bring a couple of rally cars over from the UK to something that was justified through a land investment and a, and a commercials of an, uh, a rally school. I, I think the budget ran away with this. <laughs> in the space of about two or three weeks, it became apparent that the next step for Dirtfish should really be media.